The, the next part of our program is a loosely structured response to what Paula has said by four people who I will introduce to you one after another. And uh, really, I suppose, without wanting to put words in their mouth, uh, she has posed the question loud and clear. Uh, and it's a question which will have some similarities and many differences depending on the cultural context and financial context in which it is answered. How do you make the public airways serve the people and the public interest? The first of our, our respondents to Paula's uh, paper is Professor Colin Kenny of DCU, uh, in addition to his many other qualities and achievements, is also a member of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, so it's to be hoped that some of this will travel in the other direction as well. Paul, Colin. Thank you, John. Um, I'll start by uh, the reference to the United States. I find myself there every year or two, and I, I, I greatly enjoy my visits, and I think that uh, PBS does some excellent programming that I have also enjoyed. I think, uh, I think it doesn't do the only excellent American television programming. I think we've all enjoyed, or many of us have enjoyed, programs like The Sopranos or Ad Men or Breaking Bad, uh, and I think they have great value. Programs like Meet the Press or Conan O'Brien. There's a great range of broadcasting, and there's always a definitional problem as to what makes it public service broadcasting. I'm not sure I think Downton Abbey necessarily is public service broadcasting. Maybe it is if it's on RTE or PBS, but it's not if it's on TV3 or UTV. But these, are, these are definitional issues. I think there's a deeper distinction to be made, though, between the American model of broadcasting and the European model. Uh, as the illustration uh, showed of the person turning up to give this family, precious family object, uh, to sell it and to donate money uh, to a PBS station in the United States, it illustrates the fact that there is this tradition in the United States or ideology that services we regard as the right of citizens are provided by charities across the range of social services. Uh, and that's a distinction which I think uh, is an important one. Uh, because I think there are the, the, the phrase itself even, the, the, the arrangement of the letters PSB or PBS, is it a public broadcasting service or is it a, a, a public service broadcaster, reflect a, a different approach to this whole issue. In the United States, it's been basically driven by the market, the development of broadcasting. And in that very open market, uh, a space was created where public funding was provided to uh, ensure that there was a service offering a certain kind of programming. In Europe, it was approached differently. It was approached as a, as a public good and a service was engineered which gradually then was broadened out to become uh, one service among many, but still in a very regulated environment. And I would argue we should be very slow to give that up. Um, we're seeing the privatization of a lot of services in Europe at the moment, and I think there are cautionary tales if you look at the United States as to where that can bring us, as well as good things we can learn from them. Uh, I think, for instance, the abandonment of the Fairness Doctrine was a very bad move in the United States. It's given rise to stations and services like Fox, which really have to be seen to be believed. And Fox makes Sky Television looks like the BBC, in my opinion. Uh, and I think it's very worrying. The, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, of which I'm a member, is part of a, a legislative framework which ensures that across the broad and both board and both private and public service broadcasting, there are ways in which we try to achieve certain objectives. Public, uh, both in the publicly or largely publicly funded body like RT and in the commercial stations. And we do this by a range of measures which include provision for people to complain effectively if programs aren't fair and objective or if they cause harm and defence. I don't think that's being in any state. I think that's being socially responsible. I think we have to make moral decisions, political decisions, social decisions about the kind of society we want to live in and to have the courage to follow these through with action and not abandon the world to the survival of the richest. Uh, and I think the model of television we have in general in Europe is a better one than in the United States. The Irish government at the moment faces difficult decisions about the funding of public service broadcasting. Here, um, there would be forces which would like to see the money that RTE, for instance, gets diminished, or to see its capacity to take some commercial revenue diminished. 
Well, there's arguments in favour of this and against this, uh, it's, but it's not something I think that we should um, approach frivolously. I think we should be aware of politicians making decisions that aren't based on the long-term interests uh, of the broadcasting landscape in which we live. I think through a combination of insistence that private broadcasters provide certain kinds of programming and that they do so in a fair and objective fashion, by a clever funding of public broadcasting, by a support of community radio and television stations, we can get a better result than simply leaving it up to uh, the market to determine uh, what we get. I'm certainly not uh, advocating um, uh, some kind of state dictatorship that tells people what they should get, but I'm also saying that it's naive to assume that if you simply approach it on the basis that the market will provide people with what they want, uh, you will not get the kind of television service or radio service that most of us thinks is necessary to address issues in our society that need addressing. Uh, we live at a very difficult juncture, I'm finishing up now, but we need in-depth programming, factual and drama and other kinds of programming that address us as human beings in a society where we have serious economic and social problems and, uh, and that can bring us investigative reporting. These, these programs don't have to be always on uh, a, what's called here a public service broadcast like ORT. We've seen some of the most key investigative programs uh, done by private broadcasters here, uh, but certainly we need to ensure that there's sufficient economic bulk available to a single broadcaster such as RTE so that it can and hopefully will uh, make uh, imaginative and daring programs. And I would encourage RTE facing into what is undoubtedly a difficult time for it under a lot of pressures not to lose its nerves. I think the more it makes imaginative programs, even if it makes occasional mistakes like the Father Reynolds programme, I think it's capable of bringing us new uh, and exciting uh, programmes and showing that it's worth the kind of support that it gets and that it, it should continue to get as long as it makes those kind of programming. Thank you. Could I move on now to Jerry Ellis, who uh, will be known to many of you as a member of the RT Audience Council and who has been a software engineer for over 30 years and has been a spokesman on disability issues uh, as well as his professional life and will be known to many other people in many other walks of life for that. Uh, how, how would you like to comment on what you heard? Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Paula, for the speech. Just uh, briefly, maybe first, I, before I do that, I might tell you a little bit about the Audience Council just for one minute. Um, I'd like to thank our chief for organising today because they did a, a wonderful job. I'm not going to mention names because we finished the event and have no time for anything else. But this is the Audience Council's organising this, and I'd like to thank the Audience Council for asking me to be their representative. The Audience Council is about 15 to 17 people at various stages. We come from all different uh, areas of life, from different parts of the country. We get together and we discuss what, what we think the audience uh, would like to see, what we, where we see problems, where we like to give praise and so on. We've covered such wide and uh, varied areas in our discussions as the importance of education and the inclusion of children's programming, the area of disabilities, the areas of uh, immigrants or new Irish, if you like, the area of young offenders. We've covered the area of the Mission to Pray program that uh, Colin mentioned, the presidential tweet, and so on and so on and so on, a whole wide range of things. I'd like to say maybe um, I would think that what Ireland is very good at is we look at people. So what we do, what our public service broadcasting is about people. And if you look at different groups in Ireland which, who are supposed to be minorities, you see people with disabilities around 13%, maybe one in eight people. New Irish are around 16 to 17%, maybe one in six or seven. That's, that's an enormous figure. I don't have a figure for over 65s in Ireland, but at a conference I was in Washington recently, we were told by the UN, over 65s will make around 20% of most populations by 2025. Add all those together and there ain't, they ain't no uh, minority anymore. Okay? Hopefully many of you were here earlier tonight to enjoy a cup of tea or coffee before we started. Well, imagine a society. Society is like a cup of tea or coffee. You don't have your tea and your sugar and your milk. They're all mixed together. And it's as difficult to break back down into those constituent parts of the, uh, the tea leaf, the hot water, the sugar and the milk, as a society is to try to break it down into different groups. 
and approach each group differently. And if I have time later, we'll go into many quotations about that, but let's just say that we, as an audience council, would try to say, let's look at our society as a society and address all the, find the commonalities and find the, way, the ways that we, <clears throat> we can encourage public service broadcasting to include all. And I'll just uh, finish with one theme for now, and we'll go into some more figures later. But I could talk about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the first human rights convention of the 21st century. There are 132 countries, including the European Union as a, as a bloc, have ratified this. And Article 30 of that specifically mentions television and public broadcasting as a human right. So that's just, so we're not saying it's just, not just us who are saying it, it's the whole world that's saying it. So we need to, we need to look at society as a society and see how we include all people in it. Um, we'll leave it Thank at that you. for now. I must apologize really because Jay did something that I should have done. He told all of you here who may not know much about the audience council exactly what it is and what it does. And uh, for that I'm very grateful that he has made up in part at least for the the deficiencies of the chairman. I'll now move on to Siobhan O'Donoghue, who's director of Migrant Rights Centre Ireland, to make her own contribution and to comment on what you've heard. And again, perhaps to attack that core issue, how do we make the public airwaves serve the public interest and the public? First of all, I'd like to thank mm -hmm. Paula for her wonderful yes. contribution. And I think and comment on hers too. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I thought it told a wonderful story and it was really inspiring. It's probably kind of captured, I think, everything that public service broadcasting probably should be about. Thank and I, I want to thank you for that. Um, and I, of course I had a few notes at the beginning and I scrapped all of those and I've done some new notes. <laughs> so, and I suppose one of the things that, that really struck me in your comments was that I was thinking about what we've gone through here in Ireland over the last, you know, uh, 15, 20 years. And, you know, some, we've gone from a complete kind of boom to bust cycle and there's a lot of talk about the economy but in actual fact I think that really what's been happening is been this real disconnect between people and institutions and that in some ways is reflected in all of the institutions of society and media is no um, is not immune from that um, and you know that gap between institutions including the media um, and public service broadcasting I would say and uh, and the, not just citizens, but actually the population and the people of Ireland, because there are many people who are not actually formerly citizens, is a really fundamental, I think, challenge for the future um, and how we go forward. And you know, you talked about the good to great and Jim Collins and all of that. You know, and that one of the one of the kind of um, I think ways of being um, of changing and becoming much more responsive and much more effective and successful is this kind of idea of the needing to deinstitutionalize the institutions, that the institutions, including civil society and not just, I think, public services, have, you know, have also grown to reflect that kind of power disconnect. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest challenges is to deinstitutionalize the, the, the institutions. And that requires a vision, but it also requires an understanding of power, I think, because ultimately, you know, if, if we are talking about deinstitutionalizing ourselves, we are talking about taking more risks. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about having much more meaningful relationships with people uh, who we serve, whether we're in civil society or in, say, the likes of public broadcasting um, bodies. Um, and it also requires an understanding that I think that on, when we're under threat, that often our tendency is to do is to actually centralise and, and to centralise power and to control it even more. In when, when sometimes the actual opposite is probably the more um, more successful way forward. Um, I think also public service broadcasting has a really important function in relation to identity and I think you articulated that really well, you showed us, you demonstrated it really well. And I suppose that's the, the, the you know, the, that, that's a contested area. Nobody, nobody here in this room, I think, will ever agree exactly on what the identity of Irishness or whether you call it New Irish, I actually don't call it New Irish, we are all Irish we, we, in all our diversity um, and I just think that, that the role of public service broadcasting in terms of being a mirror to ourselves making us feel uncomfortable and helping us tell stories that actually help us to, to no, negotiate navigate the way in which we, we are changing 
of, and evolving all of the time. I mean, I grew up in West Clare. You know, my, my, under, my father's perception of what it means to be Irish was so completely different to my understanding of what it means to be Ireland, and I've never actually lived anywhere else. So, and I think want to, that brings me to the other point in terms of representation, because if, if public service broadcasting and, 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 and the organisations involved are to be more reflective of what a diverse society means, then we have to start asking very serious questions, particularly in relation to gender. Women are not a minority. We are half the population. In fact, I think we're just over half the population um, and have been failed systematically, I think, by, by all um, institutions of society, including um, public service broadcasters. And I think that's a real... That's just so fundamental that it requires not just, uh, it requires a, an institutional response, not just a, a kind of a comment, I think. Also, in terms of, you, you know, Jerry mentioned ethnic diversity in 16 to 17% of the population, but also on a class basis. You know, I think we've seen, a, 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 you know, over the last number of years, kind of going to, and I'm going to finish in this comment, back to the point of, you know, what's happened in society is that what we've seen is an increasing commodification of people. So where people are entertainment, uh, value for um, for others, where people in society are seen as consumers, or as clients, or as targets, and not as real, as participants, as people who are part of a functioning society. And if you again, if you think about the role of public service broadcasting in relation to democracy, you know you have to have enough faith in the institutions of society in order for the society to function. Mm -hmm. And I really think that that. That's the challenge back to us when we think about, you know, the, trying to counter this kind of commodification that we have seen um, in our society, particularly over the last 15, uh, 20 years, that that requires then, um, I suppose, when you say the audience and people in society not to be seen as just consumers um, of content produced um, by um, whatever outlet, but actually also requires a two-way conversation and a two-way process and you can't really tell people what to think you have to both show they have to be reflected in it they have to be and you have to take risks in that that and it has to be empowering and it's wonderful to right. hear you talk about it being empowering but of course that's a very risky and very dangerous uh, game to be part of because it requires um a certain amount of power to be to be kind of um, shared um, and that does that challenges those of us in positions of power then to, to share that and I think I just want to finish on that uh, Siobhan has uh, indicated really one of the great polarities of what we're all in today and particularly around this uh, at this meeting, which is the polarity between citizens and consumers, and how that is articulated and how that tension is moderated over time is really what we're all about. And that's as good a way of introducing uh, Jack Byrne as, anybody, as anything else, because for as long as anybody has known him, Jack has been St. Saint, Saint John the Baptist of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, community radio movement, uh, which, and, and I'm after print journalism, uh, electric radio, or the old days of silent radio, as a friend of mine once referred to them. Uh, uh, radio is, is one of the mediums, I think, whose real potential is still even less explored than that of television. So, Jack. Uh, John, thank you, Paul. I think that was a very interesting presentation, uh, and I felt right at home with your description of public service media in, in the US. It sounded like community radio to me. Uh, I think that's a model that we're trying to develop here. Uh, and I think maybe RTE could learn something from that model. I, I take the point that we have developed public service media differently in Europe, uh, and while we may not want to change the model completely, I think some of the campaigning that was evident in Paula's presentation is missing from public service broadcasting in Ireland, uh, and I think we need to remedy that. And I think uh, some of the other points that, uh, maybe I should just explain briefly community radio in case some of you still don't know what it is or why I'm sitting here. Uh, I thank Colm Kenny for mentioning it and Colm has been a strong supporter of community media over the years. Uh, but going back to the 80s when there was talk about commercial media being brought in and putting manners on RTE, I was also lobbying for, for community radio. 
I wasn't making much headway because I think the problem with politicians is that they can't actually deal with two models simultaneously. Uh, so they, they opted to ignore me and develop commercial media at the time. Uh, we had to wait a little longer, but we eventually got uh, some pilot licenses in the mid 1990s. And there are now about 25 community radio stations across the state, from Donegal down to Cork, Galway to Dublin. So there's a good spread, uh, and we have two television, two community television stations, one in Dublin and one in Cork. So the model is, is developing. It's slow, mainly due to lack of resources, but the, the concept, the ethos of uh, a not-for-profit community development media that allows people who may not even get onto RTE that often, if ever, an opportunity for a voice uh, and that was the important thing for us the right to communicate we took up on Sean, Sean McBride and UNESCO's uh, declaration of every human being's right to communicate and we, that was the sort of binding ethos of what we were trying to do I think Paula mentioned you need a mission that was our mission so we didn't waver too much from that uh, I remember even in the 80s when I was talking about it, one of the commercial moguls who was strutting his stuff at the time described community radio quite dismissively as lost dog media. Uh, and, and I think that's okay. We need to find lost dogs. I mean, dogs get lost and owners fret. Uh, but we understood that what we were about was finding the lost voices, the people who weren't getting on to, even onto RTE and certainly wouldn't get too much space uh, on, on commercial media unless they were going to entertain. So that was the sort of model we, we worked with through the 80s to the 90s. And the mid-90s, we got a, a series of pilot community radio licenses. Uh, and as I say, it has taken off from there. And it's growing slowly. I'd like it to grow a bit more. But I, I'm happy to say that the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland is very well disposed to, to developing it. Our problem, as always, is there are about 30 groups around the country trying to develop community media. Lack of resources always uh, looms as, as the main problem. The other things I think Paula mentioned, excuse me, she mentioned collaboration several times and innovation. And I do think RTE, in looking to the needs of tomorrow's audiences, really does need to look at, at, at some of this collaboration. I think with the, the burgeoning community media sector, we can be good allies. We're both not-for-profit entities. Uh, I think we can, we can align ourselves. We can learn a lot from each other. There's a lot of mutual learning. And we can also work to our strengths. I noticed that the RTE's charter talks about offering a regional service uh, in providing for the citizens. And it seems to me that that points up another mile to go down the road to the village, to the urban neighbourhood. And I think that's where community media can take on that last mile from, commercial, from, from RTE. And we can, be, we can champion public service media together. Uh, and I think there's real scope for innovation in programming. And I think it will, I think the campaigning because we're coming from the bottom up campaigning. Our, our mission is to campaign for all sorts of issues, for disabilities, for migrants, for, for gay, lesbian people. I think some of that could seep eventually into RTE's programming uh, without changing dramatically the ethos of public service broadcasting. But I do think there's, there's scope for the, the two media sectors to work together. We have a lot in common and we really should be working together. Uh, yeah, because I do think that there is an ideological struggle going on in Ireland at the moment. There is a huge push to commercialise media in general, and we've this concern of media mergers. Uh, and certainly community media, I should say, it's almost like the credit union. Each small entity is independent, owned by the local community, and is not open to merging or consolidation. So it's a good model in that it's not, uh, even if it was attractive to some of the TV consortia, it's not easy to, to merge us. But I do think we should look at some form of serious collaboration with, with, with RTE because there is a problem with media plurality, that there are more amalgamations and mergers. Colin was on the Srinan uh, committee report that's with the minister at the moment, and it talks and voices concerns about just this issue of a shrinking number of outlets and voices and opinions uh, being given to us. Uh, and you could have a very narrow commercial media with the dictates of editorial sort of opinion uh, contracts uh, as it's being foisted on, on print media in some quarters. Uh, so I think to, to save media in Ireland and to encourage a growing plurality of media and outlets and voices and opportunities for people to innovate with programming, we really do need to work to our strengths. And I do think that between ourselves and RTE, we could look to the future with confidence.